Hello, the internet, and welcome to the podcast Byzantium and Friends. I am Anthony, your host. I am always struck by a scene in the 12th century historian Nikitas Honiatis, who's writing about the late 12th century. Uh, there was a uh, rebellion, and um, the rebel Vranas uh, was besieging Constantinople, and he had sent some of his soldiers uh, across the Golden Horn to occupy the hills on the other side of the city. Koniati says that their armor was shining in the rays of the sun, uh, you know, burnished as it was, and everybody in the city came out to see these glowing lightning soldiers that were occupying the top of the opposite hills. The image has kind of stuck with me as a way of looking at Constantinople. Um, I even found uh, accounts of 19th century travelers who say that um, they would cross the Bosporus and uh, go over to the other side, the Asian side of the Bosporus, uh, early, uh, before sunrise, so that they could look at Constantinople from the east as the sun rose behind them and illuminated different parts of the city as its rays sort of worked their way down the side of the monuments. I'm fascinated by the potential that the designers of Constantinople made use of this effect, and in particular, the column and statue of Constantine in the form of Constantine. So this is one of the first definitive iconic monuments of Constantinople when it was unwrapped in 330, was this colossal statue of Constantine. It was a nude, gilded, uh, you know, could be five meters or more tall on the top of a almost 40 meter high column made of porphyry stone, which is this very particular type of purple red rock that um, the ancients believed kind of glowed with the light of the sun. And this was the highest point of the city when it was first created. And so just imagine what would happen when the sun came up in the east over the the hills on the Asian side of the Bosporus. And the first thing that the rays of the sun would touch would be the colossal statue of Constantine, which, given its materials, would, would, would shine like a second sun over the city, which is exactly what the sources call it, not just because it was a repurposed Apollo. You know, this is part of Constantine's sort of ideology of the, you know, the Sol Invictus uh, emperor, the kind of sun god king and so forth, uh, which is definitely part of the story, but it literally was an Apollo and it had these <clears throat> rays coming out of the head. Um, so, yeah, the statue would glow like a sun over the city before um, the rays of the uh, light touched any part of the uh, Constantinople uh, directly. And you have some very similar um, light effects in the evening when the sun is setting in the west. If you're sitting on the Asian side and you're looking to the west, to Constantinople, and you just see the, the silhouette of a Hagia Sophia uh, with the sun in the deep background. Um, it's really quite amazing. It still dominates the skyline of that you know, part of the city, even, even today. And yet there's one thing that you won't see there today, uh, which was in fact the, the definitive imperial monument of Constantinople in all, so all the centuries after Justinian, was another colossal statue, uh, an equestrian statue of an emperor. It was repurposed, so after Justinian, it designated Justinian for most observers. And it, too, was on top of a very, very tall column that we know originally from Procopius was encased in bronze. So it it was a built masonry column, but sheathed in bronze. And it was the tallest column to ever bear uh, an equestrian statue of that size, uh, so it's just this massive, uh, over four tons of, uh, of emperor and horse uh, that somehow Justinian lifted up uh, to such heights, right next to Hagia Sophia, facing east. So he cut in front of the line, in front of Constantine. Uh, so there's, there's this row of imperial columns and statues in Constantinople. So if you were approaching the city from the south, uh, you know, in those days, you know, before skyscrapers and such, and you, you would, the, the, the most impressive thing that you would see 
other than the silhouettes of some churches and so on, were, the, were these row of imperial columns, 40 meters tall, with huge statues on top, marching from you know east to west or whatever. And Justinian put himself right in front of the line, right next to Hagia Sophia. And that statue and its column, which is completely gone now, <laughs> we don't even know the exact spot where it was, was for a thousand years the sort of it's along with Hagia Sophia or after Hagia Sophia the emblematic monument of Constantinople and it also designated imperial power it was a kind of shorthand for designating imperial power so all of this and the entire history of this monument is now laid out fully for us in a wonderful new book by Elena Beck my guest today which is called The Bronze Horseman of Justinian in Constantinople, The Cross-Cultural Biography of a Mediterranean Monument. And so this is one of those monuments, and according to this is one of those books that sort of traces the changing perspectives of a single monument through all of the different cultures that interacted with it, and not just the indigenous East Roman one that built it, but also all the others um, we could pass through, like the Crusaders who identified it with Heraclius um, and later the Ottomans, but also Italian humanists uh, who began to look at it from an antiquarian standpoint, um, and also uh, so many painters of the early modern period who put a column just like that with an equestrian statue on top and often in the to corner background of their painting to kind of signify that what I'm saying here in this painting has something to do with imperial power. Um, and all, all, all of this is explored um, wonderfully in, in this new book that I've been waiting for for some time. The Monuments of Constantinople are, have a special fascination for me. Now, as you can tell from this intro, I, I like to think about how we might visualize them. And um, uh, this book does a great job uh, for, for this particular monument that not that many people know about. Uh, it kind of been effaced from the way we think about Constantinople uh, during that millennium, but I, I hope this book will put it back uh, in, in the, the place of prominence that it deserves. All right, so let's get right to it. Uh, thank you to Medievalist.net for reposting these podcasts, um, and here's my uh, discussion with Elena about her new book. Elena, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Anthony. Glad to be think- back. I think uh, this is the first episode that I'm recording, which is about a book that we had promised to discuss when it was out the first time we did an episode together. And this is the first one that's appeared since then. I've made that promise with other guests, but you're the first one to reach the finish line. Well, I'm glad. (laughs) So congratulations. You've written a very large book about a monument that I think very few people know about. And it does deserve more attention. I, I, you, you know, you find exactly as much evidence as fills this very large book. So it's, it's uh, deserved. Um, so this is about Justinian's column and the traditions that developed about it, its importance in the way that people thought about not only Constantinople, but imperial power in general for centuries, even after Byzantium. So before we talk about Justinian's column and the statue at its top, um, can you just say a little bit about what imperial columns were and the tradition of imperial columns in Constantinople specifically? So what's the context into which this column is being inserted? Well, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, let, let me see, I'll try to be as short as possible because the history of the imperial columns by the time Justinian builds his is uh, practically half a millennium long. So it's already an established tradition, but the tradition which starts really with Trajan. So Trajan's column in Rome is the true innovation. And the, the, thankfully the column still stands. And if we can visit uh, Rome these days, uh, we will see lots of tourists standing right by it. So it's a huge attraction. And uh, the next column is a column of Marcus Aurelius, which has been called perhaps the greatest case of architectural plagiarism. And because going from very innovative Trajan's column to a column which very strongly imitates it. So the reason why to compare these two right away, um, it's a powerful statement. It's a very tall monument, um, nearly 30 meters 
at all, and I'll be staying in the metric system, sorry. That's fine. Uh, and uh, with the statue of the emperor, which stood on top. And so it became a controlling point and a vantage point. And with the column of Trajan, it's also the centerpiece of his form. So in terms of creating an urban ensemble and a statement to imperial power, this becomes the model to be imitated, to be admired and to replicate. And in Constantinople, the first emperor to do this is Constantine. And so Constantine's column and Constantine's forum become the model for subsequent emperors in Constantinople, most notably Theodosius. Theodosius and his son Arcadius are in direct dialogue also with the old Rome, because for a long time, Constantinople had an inferiority complex in relationship to the great monuments of old Rome. And so the column of Trajan and the column of Marcus Aurelius are either, we can call them either narrative or figural columns. So they have a very extensive visual narrative wrapping around the band of the mm -hmm. column. And the columns of uh, Theodosius and Arcadius had the same model. So this direct dialogue. Then comes Justinian's column. Justinian's great column is an innovation in relation to all columns which came before. Uh, and at the same time is in dialogue with tradition. How is it in dialogue with tradition? It's a centerpiece of Justinian's forum. And we can argue that Justinian's forum, that is the Augustaean, was the last forum of the ancient or late antique world. Uh, the column is an innovation because this is the first and only column to carry an equestrian monument. All other columns had a standing figure of an emperor. Carrying an equestrian statue requires new calculations for the width of a plinth, for the width of a column, uh, for the load bearing capacity, etc. Mm -hmm. So this is where Justinian is both innovating and keeping tradition. And uh, with the other columns, just very briefly, so the columns of Trajan, Marcus Aurelius, uh, Theodosius, and Arcadius all had internal staircases. These became important as uh, vantage points to see the city. Uh, there were graffiti inside, inside of the column of Trajan. There are still a lot of graffiti from the, wow. also from the Greek visitors uh, or Greek writing visitors uh, from late antiquity. So that was a very important thing to do. But also this made columns accessible to the top. That is, uh, if one wanted to restore them, if one wanted to, let's say, change mm -hmm. monuments or adjust them. Justinian's was a solid one. Solid column was great for construction, efficient construction, but terrible for subsequent restorations. Uh, so this is roughly the context of it. Right. So just to give a sense, a visual sense for the audience here, if you're approaching Constantinople by sea from the south, the skyline of the city is kind of dominated by, well, punctuated or marked by these columns that are kind of in a row from, let me, you know, east to west or west to east, whatever. Um, and they're, they're very tall and they have these colossal statues on top. And um, of course, then you have the dome of Hagia Sophia, which is, is probably the dominant element. Um, and yeah, so you're, you're right that some of these you could climb up to the top. And I think we have at least one, isn't um, the suggestion that Constantine the Rhodian in the 10th century, who read this poetic description of Constantinople that he had gone up I think the Theodosian column and right. yeah, and seeing the city from up there. Um, a, another thing that you can do with a column is throw someone off of it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, this, this, this innovative approach uh, crusaders were good at. Yes. Uh, so, and some of them actually went up col uh, the columns of Constantinople too and talked about the views and purportedly hermit uh, dwellings at the tops of them. Right, so like stylites, right, um, are mentioned, uh, and yeah. By the way, so the person who's thrown off is Alexius the fifth, um, and he had already been blinded at that point by Alexius the <laughs> third, but they threw him off anyway. Um, and then twelve oh four. All right, yeah. So those are interesting things that you can do with columns. 
Um, now, you mentioned some of the technical aspects um, about construction and restoration, and I want to uh, dive into those a little bit because I think we sometimes forget, but your book does a great job of bringing to the fore the technical complexity and ambition of setting one of these things up, and perhaps less so the column itself as the equestrian statue. Um, so um, can you tell us a little bit about the construction of, you know, when and, and, and where and how uh, this thing was put together? And, and by the way, what you mentioned, the form of, of Justinian, this is the Augustaeum, this is the square to the south of Hagia Sophia, which in, in your book you talk about is kind of the form of Constantine, of Justinian, because yeah, he kind of appropriated that whole space for himself and put his column in, in it was sort of the middle. But um, anyway, yeah, tell us a little bit about the technical aspects. So before um, I get into the technical aspects, very quick uh, background, because uh, by the time Justinian comes on stage, uh, Constantinople is the imperial center for 200 years. It's extensively built up. What makes it possible for Justinian to build and to transform the city center into his image is the uh, Nika riots or Nika rebellion, depending on how one sees Justinian. And so in 532, the center of the city burns and it burns extensively. And uh, Justinian makes a crisis into an opportunity. So this is when the reconceptualization, architectural reconceptualization of Hagia Sophia takes place. Uh, he redesigns this entire access entry point to the Imperial Palace. He makes it his own. So the uh, Imperial Gate, the Bronze Gate, the Halki Gate. Uh, Hagia Sophia is rebuilt, redesigned. Um, the, and all of these buildings are facing the Augustaean, uh, the space of Justinian's power. Um, quick side note on the Augustaean, we don't know its parameters, we don't know mm -hmm. its size, uh, the, it's a subject of debate but clearly Justinian monumentalizes it. So the Senate building faces it, the Imperial Palace faces it, the uh, zero mile marker, the million uh, adjacent to it, the Basilica Cistern is adjacent to it. So it's monumental space of power. So when the rebuilding of this space and when the Hagia Sophia project is implemented, I argue that uh, the column is also part of the design already by this point uh, for several, several reasons, uh, because the column has to be in terms of sequence of uh, building the last project in this area. Hagia Sophia is an enormous building. It's completed in 537. The final stage of the project, monumentalizing the Augustan, is the column. And so it probably began shortly after the Hagia Sophia is completed and probably by the same architectural team who worked on Hagia Sophia because there are certain, based on the descriptions of the masonry of the column, there are certain similarities with the construction of Hagia Sophia and the descriptions by the likes of Procopius who tells us a lot about Hagia Sophia, but he does not like the column. So he doesn't tell that much about that one. Uh, the way the uh, structure was built. So we have to imagine a dialogue between two monuments, Hagia Sophia and the column as envisioned originally by Justinian. The column is completed around 542, 543, and the um, equestrian statue is put on top at that point. And um, I believe that Justinian had set sights on a specific equestrian monument before the design for the column was implemented because an equestrian statue required mm -hmm. particular scale of the column and a very um, different set of issues from finding the plinth so a stone foundation, to uh, a stone slab to be put at the top of a column, which was probably at least 10 meters long. Wow. So you have to be able to lift something like that and place it uh, and put it in place. And uh, the uh, column had two plinths. And the interesting thing is, is late medieval visitors comment on them. Mm 
How did they put that piece of stone there? Why did they do it? We also know that the plinth had cracked uh, by the late 13th century at least. So there are also comments about that. Mm -hmm. So the construction process is very complicated, which requires a lot of heavy engineering. And one of the interesting things is it's probably military engineers or military technology, uh, which would have been required to lift up to the top of a column. How tall was the column? Tricky issues. Uh, if only Gregoras uh, yeah. was willing to actually tell us the measurements, he tells us when he goes up in the 14th century, he says, anybody who can calculate the length of uh, shadows can figure out what the column, how tall the column was. So I don't bother yes. with such small things. So uh, leaving, leaving that issue aside, um, visual representations, uh, a lot of images, including the one I have on the cover of a book, uh, the column is as tall as Hagia Sophia, the Dome of Hagia Sophia, which would be very difficult for us to imagine because the church dominates Mm -hmm. or the museum or a mosque, depending yeah. on how one sees it, um, dominates our imagination. So two monuments uh, facing each other, two colossal monuments and two colossal monuments of Justinian. So that would be the technical side. The equestrian monument, um, Justinian took it from the form of Theodosius. Uh, we have different forms of evidence, one contemporary, uh, sixth century uh, Malalas in this case tells us that this was a statue of the emperor of Arcadius. And then uh, in the 15th century, a Theodosian inscription is discovered on the monument and the monument spe speaks in its own voice, so to say, right. that it's a Theodosian monument. In the form of Theodosius, there were two colossal equestrian bronze sculptures. And I believe that this was an insurance policy. If one failed and they dropped it while they were lifting it, there was the second one mm. they could try. Uh, they were successful, but this was truly unprece unprecedented and innovative because the, uh, the statue would have weighed, the weight would have been at least 4,500 kilos. For those operating in pounds, it would be at least 9,000 pounds. Uh, so, or closer to 10,000. And that's a conservative estimate based on calculations in relation to the uh, equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius. Um, and I can talk about sizes later, but in terms of lifting something like that, we have to imagine a crane um, or another form of device. It would have been extremely complicated and would, would have been an enormous work site. And we have to imagine three more things. The statue from the Theodos, form of Theodosius taken off its pedestal uh, and placed on the conveyance device. It would have moved along the main street, the Meze, uh, nearly a mile, so at least 1,600 meters. And then it had to be lifted and placed at the top and secured at the top of a plinth. And the plinth had to be the the um, the calculations had to be made in such a way that the plinth is not too wide and not too narrow. If it's too wide, it blocks the view. If it's too narrow, the horse right. can stand there. So all of these things had to be completed before the statue was put up there. And once it's put up there, it's a statue of Justinian. Right. It loses so, its former identity. So we have to imagine a very large and elaborate scaffolding put around the whole column at, that also incorporates a kind of crane device operated by presumably hundreds of people, right? Pulling uh, on right. ropes in different direct in all directions to make sure it doesn't tip one way or the other. Uh, it, it's just a pity we don't have any kind of descriptions of this. Um, and you, you point out in the book that um, the closest that we get to that is on the base of the obelisk in the Hippodrome that actually has images of how the obelisk is being transported and, and, and raised. Um, but yeah, so the statue, the equestrian statue is, um, so in comparison to life size, it's how many times larger about? So a 15th century uh, calculation on the height of the seated emperor alone is purportedly 20 feet tall for the emperor, right. reportedly. Again, right. uh, how, how the measurements were done, et cetera, would be problematic. 
Uh, it's um, at least, it's almost double the size of a statue of Marcus Aurelius, uh, the one equestrian one still surviving. And that's again based by on different measurements. So we have the Byzantine 14th century measurements, we have Italian 15th century measurements, and again, we have 16th century measurements. Um, so yeah, at least seven and a half meters tall. Um, Okay. Uh, for 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 the horseman uh, for the horse with the horseman, and that's conservative estimate. Right, right. So, what does the um, presence of this column and statue do to the architectural environment, the, the sort of monumental landscape of that that part of Constantinople? Well, um, I think it was a really brilliant strategic move because Constantine uh, it, is. It, well, um, it, it's just clever. Uh, Constantine used to be the one who was at the center of the narrative, in a way, uh, spatially. The Forum of Constantine in the Chain of Succession was the first one. The Theodosia, uh, Forum of Theodosius was behind and so on. So you were supposed to fall back in line almost to the, let's say, uh, the Golden Gate and know mm -hmm. your place. But Justinian upstages uh, Constantine. He puts his forum ahead, um, the closest one to the imperial palace. So it's at the center of imperial power. This is uh, the column would have been visible from the Hippodrome, for example, the largest space for public gatherings in the city. Uh, the column would have been visible from the imperial palace. It's definitely visible from Hagia Sophia and so on. So it becomes the center part, uh, centerpiece of the imperial experience. The great church is, of course, the centerpiece of religious experience. So it's at the center of everything. It redefines the skyline, as you alluded to the fact that Hagia Sophia was the defining feature on the horizon. Travelers coming from the south claim that they see the horsemen a day in advance of arriving in the city. So it's also redefining the horizon, redefining expectations. And because of its dialogue with the great church, it becomes basically something like an urban icon of Constantinople. And that's a term of Diane Favreau, which is a really nice way of thinking about uh, summarizing the city and the experience of the city. Yeah, I think that's very important for all of us who, you know, work on and think about and try to imagine Constantinople for the that whole millennium, that this statue was really in, in view. Um, no matter where you were, what you were looking at, the odds were good that it was somewhere either in the foreground or the background of, you know, whatever angle you were looking from, um, you would ha literally have to be on the other side of Hagia Sophia to not be able to see it. And there wasn't much of that much importance, you know, on the other side of Hagia Sophia uh, at that time. Uh, so it really was an urban icon in, in, in this way. And so there were some parts of the statue that received more attention um, in, in our sources, or also in the, you know, ongoing restoration projects that were, you know, started to become necessary after a while. Now in the book, you, you talk about some of the literary sources that describe um, the monument. And, you know, I don't want to get into that. It's kind of hard to convey close literary readings, um, you know, in the podcast medium. Uh, but let's talk about some of the episodes uh, that are described, uh, you know, however we interpret them, uh, such as the the restoration of the tufa <laughs> under, the, under Theophilus. So what is a tufa and, and what did that uh, work in, involve? So the tufa, the short definition of a tufa is a peacock-shaped helmet crown. I want oh, one. Peacock plume. So bronze, Im imagine bronze peacock feathers attached to the top of a crown, which looks like a helmet and which is gilded. I do. I do imagine that. Uh, in addition to the fact that it would be probably stupendous headache to wear something like that, uh, it, but it looks good. Uh, so uh, the tufa, uh, the origins of the tufa are still debated. Possibly the uh, when Justinian had the uh, horseman put up, it's possible that the headgear of the statue was uh, enhanced. To, pre, uh, to represent the royal splendor. Uh, so just very quickly, the statue is um, 
an imperial uh, statue and military dress. We can imagine all sorts of Roman emperors, you know, uh, wearing the breastplate, etc. Uh, right hand raised in a gesture of speech or command, left hand holding an orb, which is uh, topped by a cross. And so the orb uh, with the cross at the top, probably Justinian's addition, the cross at the top of the orb. The tufa, possibly also Justinian's, otherwise not really likely that there were any modifications made. Uh, the restoration of the tufa. Until the ninth century, we don't have our sources, after, after the sixth century, we don't really have our sources tell us much about the behavior of the monument. Nothing alarming happens until the year roughly 839-840. The tufa falls. The tufa falls and the, the source which talks about it is uh, Simeon the Logophyte. And uh, the Logophyte uh, is the kind of source which has been um, I wouldn't say ignored, but uh, suffered from benign neglect. Let's put it this way. And Logophy tells us the following. Uh, the emperor uh, wanted to restore the tufa. And the side note here, uh, the emperor is an iconoclast, right? So in Orthodox sources, um, iconoclast emperors suffer from all sorts of vials and evils. And so here there was a good opportunity to turn the emperor's obsession with the restoration of the tufa into something negative, but it was not done. Um, Theophilos wants to restore the tufa. Everybody agrees that it's important. Uh, nobody knows how to do it. Remember, there is no internal staircase, so you can't just go up and put it back. So a solution is found, and the solution is found, which is pretty brilliant. A skilled roofer goes up to the roof tiles of Hagia Sophia, shoots an arrow, presumably aiming for between the legs of a horse, the, uh, the arrow gets stuck there as an anchor device. The roofer goes up, puts a tufa back, uh, gets 100 gold coins from the emperor, and everybody is happy. Now, this is a very interesting and unusual uh, event, and an event which reveals the enormous power of that statue for the both apparently the populace and the emperors. So. When um, our emperor, Theophilos, decides to celebrate his military triumphs, he wears a tufa. He has a tufa represented on his copper coins. And you can really see that plumed uh, headgear. And in the just a year before the tufa falls, the emperor suffers probably his greatest defeat. In 838, he loses Amorium. The city of Amorium, and he is, he, his family lineage, he is an mm -hmm. Amorium. So it's uh, also an insult to the family name. And of course, uh, he loses it to his great rivals, the Abbasids. And the fall of the Tufa clearly here speaks to that tremendous trauma, danger, humiliation of the loss of Amorian, and clearly the restoration and making the monument whole is essential for the future of the Byzantine Empire and for the future of the emperor. So here we see the prophetic or the um, uh, power or the agency of the monument to uh, foretell the future of the empire and to contribute to its longevity. Yeah, so it acquires these symbolic meanings um, that you trace throughout the book and, it, and, and those compound over time. So it, it gets more and more tightly bound with the fate of the city and, uh, and of the, the dynasty or the emperor in, uh, in particular. Um, this is another great story uh, that appears in the Patria and, and this is about um, Ignatius, one of the builders. Um, so why don't you tell us that story, which is a, it's a great story in itself, uh, but also what it means. Uh, it's a wonderful story. So the, the narrative on the construction of Hagia Sophia, uh, this is where the story comes from. 
And the origins of the text, like all sorts of things, are complicated, but it appears in the more or less final, let's call it final form for our purposes. By the end of the 10th century, it's a stable narrative tradition, which uh, gets to be repeated and translated into multiple languages. That's a very important thing here about the narrative on the construction of Hagia Sophia. Uh, it's known in Slavi, in the Slavonic world, it's known in Latin, it will be translated into Ottoman Turkish and to Persian. So it's enormously widespread story. And the story which celebrates the construction of Hagia Sophia and the story which condemns the hubris and arrogance of Justinian. And the monument, our um, equestrian monument becomes the monument of hubris. So the story of Ignatius. Ignatius is the master builder of Hagia Sophia and of the monument in this story. Justinian becomes jealous of Ignatius's popularity and he's worried that uh, Ignatius has won the hearts and minds of the populace. So Justinian decides to leave Ignatius to die at the top of the column, just as the column is completed. Ignatius being a dedicated architect apparently misses when the scaffolding is removed <laughs> because he's working so hard on the column. And he is left there to die. Uh, luckily for him, he has uh, layer, multiple layers of clothing. And he figures out if he tears different parts of his robes and makes them into a, a something like a rope, he, it can reach all the way down to the ground. So uh, that's an important element. Next element, um, Ignatius has a loyal and uh, emotional wife who shows up in the middle of the night and laments his fate and is about to wake up the whole city. And he tells, tells him, uh, excuse me, he tells her, don't cry, go buy uh, the amount of rope, sturdy rope, the equivalent to the length of a column. The equivalent is not provided for us in feet, meters, or any other uh, uh, forms of measurements. And get a lot of pitch and get the rope uh, covered with pitch and bring it the next night. She does it. He lifts the rope with his uh, shredded uh, clothing, which was made into another rope, flim flimsy rope, up. He comes down the column. He burns the evidence. Right. That's why the pitch had to be there, that he escaped. He leaves the town for three years. And then he comes back to Constantinople and he confronts Justinian as Justinian is going through uh, on the procession uh, on the Meze. The interesting place where he confronts Justinian here, side note, is by the pal palace of Lausus. And I'll leave it as a side note for just a second. So he confronts Justinian. Justinian says something along the lines of, well, you know, if God wanted, uh, decided to save you, a thousand men could not kill you. So good for you. Uh, and um, the place is important because in other variants of Justinian hubris narrative, this is where Justinian left his successful general Bil Belisarius, whom Justinian had blinded. Uh, to beg by the palace of Lausus. So the narrative circles back mm. to the jealousy of Justinian in an interesting way, it's a pattern. And what the narrative also is doing, it does not allow Justinian rehabilitation because in the Christian narrative redemption the framework, one cries, prays for one's sins, one gives gifts and one is forgiven. Justinian is left without that possibility. And so the column here has a very strong negative valence because he, may, he put it up there to proclaim that he is the founder. He tried to destroy his builder. And so column reflects in this narrative, the irritation of it, let's call it the faithful who would have been annoyed to see the column every time they were approaching Hagia Sophia uh, from the Meze, because mm -hmm. you could not escape the triumphal column without right. when you are looking towards the great church. Yeah, there was no there was no way to escape the fact that the emperor dominated that landscape. Um, and but I should say that these stories about Ignatius and Justinian meeting and all of that, that, that I think they're completely unhistorical. 
um, later legends. Um, and nevertheless, I mean, interesting for the way in which people thought about these monuments and these people later on. But uh, there's a, there's a fairy tales. Um, let's uh, skip ahead. If I may interject, yes. uh, I would respectfully disagree with, uh, with the qualification as fairy, fairy well, tales. No fairies in there. They, uh, they reflect the mental landscape. Uh, they reflect contemporary concerns and preoccupations. Yes, they are fictional, but the boundary between fiction and history in people's minds can be very complicated. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Um, these narratives became a reality for a lot of people when they beheld these monuments and when they thought of them and when they thought about the past. Yes, isn't that the case? Um, that <laughs> Legends become reality for people who believe them. I wonder where we might look today to find such things happening. I mean, that would require some research. Um, okay, <laughs> let's skip ahead to some um, more historically attested uh, interventions in, in the column. And this specifically the Paleologan restoration, about which we have quite a bit of information by people who were, you know, involved in it. Uh, but let's start first with, again, some technical um, aspects, how and why would a statue and column of this kind corrode over time such that it would require to be, you know, propped up or, you know, restored, um, what we're now almost seven or eight centuries after it was put mm -hmm. up? Uh, so very interesting question. Uh, in a way, this column, uh, this statue is an outlier because it did not fall. All sorts of statues were falling in Constantinople since the at least the fifth century. Yeah. Uh, there were winds. There were um, all sorts all sorts of reasons why the statues fell. But the most important one for bronze statues uh, would be corrosion. So. Uh, what happens with the Paleologan restoration and the need for restoration? Um, a part of either the orb or the cross from the orb falls. And so one of the things I was trying to understand is uh, why would that happen? And one of the reasons is as a metal statue corrodes, it becomes lighter, literally. So a heavy object, what used to be a very heavy object, which could not be dislodged, let's say, by a terrible wind, can now be dislodged. But let's consider corrosion for a second. So corrosion is an inevitable process for metal works which are exposed to the elements outside. In Constantinople, the biggest one would be humidity. Mm. Uh, it's, it's the sea air. It's uh, the situation is that it's constant assault by humidity. So that's one. Temperature, the other one, the daytime, nighttime changes. Uh, also, the statue would be heated at different rates. Uh, the uh, parts of the statue, so the hooves, the tail of a horse closest to the stone would be warmer than the rest of the statue because of the uh, lo losing temperature at different rates. The parts of uh, the statue faced east. So uh, part of the statue is heated in the morning. The right, other right. part is heated at night. So mm. those changes. Air pollution. Birds, bird droppings. Bird droppings, uh, very. Bird droppings in, in uh, I was reading quite a bit about um, restoration of monuments in Italy. So pigeons are terrible for uh, ancient and medieval bronzes. Um, wind pressures, another one. And finally, actually, the restorations, which also contri contributed to the demise of a monument, as in the of. Uh, um, the attempts to improve its condition actually caused deterioration, regilding. Regilding would have required scraping off corrosion layers, which would have been five to six centimeters thick, potentially, wow. um, to about two inches at least. And that's again, uh, comparative to the cleaning of the statue of Marcus Aurelius, uh, which was undertaken in the 1980s. And so cleaning, and removing layers would have actually weakened the uh, la layers of bronze, which are still surviving. 
Uh, when they would have gotten up there to clean it up, uh, they would have seen all sorts of corrosion in different colors. And the monument was so thickly covered that the Theodosian inscription was hidden behind it. So this is just as a background ah. to, uh, mm. to, to the um, issues of corrosion. Final thing with corrosion, water would have likely pooled at the feet of a statue and it would have contributed to the cracking of the um, plinth. Right, so what did they do to fix it in those circumstances? So what they thought they would do versus what they ended up having to do was quite different. So um, about the year 1317, uh, the statue drops either the cross or the cross topped orb. Um, Gregoras is trying to be very cautious on what he is saying and uh, what he is saying the statue dropped. So they have to build scaffolding and they have to build very strong scaffolding which can withstand also winds in the city. So cross braces, all sorts of things, complicated thing. And when they get to the top thinking that all they need to do is to put back the orb, they realize that the entire metal substructure on which the horse is resting is about to collapse. And this is where another interesting point comes in. So an equestrian monument rests on several points. So the, this horse had uh, one front leg up and one hind leg up properly, but the tail would have contributed to the balancing points. And generally there were several balancing points. Now with an equestrian statue, the greatest weight is where roughly the saddle is, where the figure Mm -hmm. is placed at the top. And so in the medieval period, they thought that this is the part, the rib cage of a horse that would have to be supported the most. So at some point, perhaps under the Justinian, perhaps uh, later, uh, the metal or the iron substructure which supported the horse cor um, corroded almost completely. So they have to rebuild the supports, metal support uh, for the belly of the horse, but this also uh, uh, alters how the um, pressure points on the plinth are distributed. And what they do is they take down the orb and they take down the tufa and they clean it and regild it. This of course clearly signifies that these are the parts that they want to be the most visible. Oh, yeah. And these are the most important imperial uh, aspects of the monument. Now, this is where the laws of unintended consequences kicks in. Uh, because imagine the statue which had been completely corroded, uh, the color is completely dark, uh, bland, green, black, et cetera, et cetera, boring color. And all of a sudden you have the super gilded elements. This becomes, and they shine in the light, this mm -hmm. becomes a source of attraction and fascination for visitors. And we have lots of comments about this very action because it also reveals to visitors that this was not just a structural um, restoration, but this was also aesthetic and symbolic. And so the fascination now shifts to the orb from the tufa. Theophilus was preoccupied with the tufa. Now every, everything is about the orb. And so we have it almost in real time travelers and armchair travelers talking about where is the orb? Has it fallen down? Is it in the hand of a horseman? And what does it say about the future of the empire? Uh, yeah, so this points to some of the symbolic associations of the monument. And um, I'd like us in, in conclusion here to talk a little bit about the... Um, <laughs> Well, I'm just going to say it. So sort of misidentifications or creative <laughs> re-identifications, there you go, um, of the statue by other people um, and, and, you know, why they happened, what their significance was. So how did the statue, you know, enter stories that sort of spread beyond the narrow circle of, you know, Constantinopolitan elite who knew its history and, you know, read Procopius or whatever. Um, so what, what kind of other lives did it take on? It, it took on many lives. So one thing I want to say is 
the past gets to be reworked um, particularly strong ways when um, people face dramatic um, cultural social transformations. That's when past usually gets to be re-examined particularly strongly. And so the new identities that are assigned to the horsemen are associated with these moments in the life of Constantinople and in the life of the Byzantine Empire or the Roman Empire or the Empire of Constantinople, whatever we would like to call it. So uh, at the time of Crusades, um, one of the interesting things with this statue, why does it survive? Because it got to be re-identified as Heraclius. Re-identification as Heraclius in the West, as in, in the Latin language cultural sphere, was a process already going on from the 11th century in various ways, moving towards identifying as Heraclius. So uh, the horseman becomes Heraclius, identified as Heraclius, and survives, uh, survives crusader pillages because Heraclius for crusaders is very important as the proto-crusader. He is the model emperor. So here, this creative re-identification contributes to a um, community preserving a shared ancestor. Let's call him that way. Mm. In the 15th century, the horseman gets to be re-identified as Constantine. And I think that is part of the issue of the end of the empire. Because the first empire, the empire was founded by Constantine, and so we're coming full circle to the foundational monument, or the monument which becomes literally talisman of Constantinople, signifying its points of origins and greatness, therefore changing its identity. And uh, there is a beautiful um, prophecy, very pithy prophecy in Russian, and as all, all uh, after the fact prophecy is very true, uh, and the... Uh, because that's how they work. Uh, and it, uh, the prophecy uh, and the statement is uh, about uh, the Byzantine Empire begun by Constantine and by Constantine ended. So the end in a way, which was understandable already for a very long time, uh, the end is brought in the same way and by the same individual as the beginning. So we have uh, those re-identifications. Uh, in the Ottoman context, and the Ottoman context is a very interesting one, uh, the statue's identity is fluid, but what's important is the orb, back to the orb. In the Ottoman retellings, uh, the orb is lost and it's the sign of futility of the emperor who believed he held the world and he cannot take the world with him, he had lost the world. So again, the after the fact prophecies identifying a prophetic monument from the Byzantine version of the monument, which will keep the empire safe to the Ottoman versions, the monument which proves the futility mm. of the previous empire. So these are some of the creative re-identifications. And of course, by that point, the, the statue of Constantine, his own colossal statue on top of his column, Porphyry column, had fallen uh, in 1106, I think. I think it had actually squished some poor people in his forum uh, underneath, um, sort of knocked over by a gale. So there was no statue of Constantine to, you know, stand in for the founder of the city. And to, it kind of makes sense that they would have picked the most impressive statue uh, still standing uh, to identify with the founder, especially in a time when they're you know, creating all of these prophecies and stories and legends that link beginnings and ends and, and all of this. And as, as you point out in the book, uh, I mean, in some detail about how the, the anxiety over the orb and the cross are sort of linked in some sort of talismanic way to the survival of the empire and, 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 and all that. Um, and then you have, you, you know, you talk about uh, Kiyakos of Ancona, who's starts this process of sort of antiquarian archaeology, kind of trying to figure out exactly what this is and using the inscription. And he's a, the first sort of epigrapher as we consider him and so on. So there are all of these things going on in the later period. Um, I, I want to close with the following question because it really, really struck me. You find all of these paintings, mostly Western paintings from, you know, the late medieval, Renaissance period onward that have little 
little or bigger images of the column of Justinian with the equestrian statue on top. And sometimes they're foregrounded and sometimes they're in the background. Um, and there's so many of them. So I guess, I mean, I, I just have a curiosity question. First of all, so how do you find these? Like you just looking through paintings for a equestrian statues on columns in the background. Um, and secondly, and more importantly, um, what do these signify in these paintings? Like what's the range of meanings that the, the, uh, the bronze horseman has? Mm -hmm. uh, very, very interesting question. So the um, answer on the how to find them. Uh, with the Paleologan uh, restoration, I posited that since it was such an important event, and because we also know from late, uh, from travelers that this is a subject of great preoccupation and the need to put the orb back, the orb keeps falling, they keep putting it back, that it is the event of international significance and therefore people are paying attention to that. So I posited that we should be able to find some physical evidence for it. And uh, before the 15th century, very quickly, we have the wonderful armchair traveler plagiarist, extremely popular uh, travels of John Mandeville. Mm. Uh, there was no such night. Uh, the night did not go to Constantinople, but none, uh, but it is uh, the narrative is based on um, a real account of a real experience, but became very popular. And so there is a description of Constantinople there. And so uh, knowing that there are hundreds of uh, practically Mandeville manuscripts, I wanted to look and see what is the Constantinople of his imagination, both narratively and visually. And so some of the most interesting images came from the Mandeville uh, narratives because they literally, one of my favorite ones shows Justinian on the horse. The horse looks like a dog, but it doesn't matter. It's an, uh, it's an unattractive image, but very interesting intellectually because the emperor holds used to help hold a uh, orb and it's the orb is halfway down on the ground to the ground so literally in motion mm. so this was this was a response to the um, paleologan restorations but by the 15th century the situation is different and again it's about positing a hypothesis we have um, the fall of Constantinople because people keep talking about it, expecting it. You know, we have uh, Ottoman sieges, one, another, third, etc. cetera. Uh, they're expecting it. So this is an end of a civilization that is coming. So the monument gets to be represented in civilizational turning points. Athens invaded by Xerxes. We're talking about ancient Athens here. So fifth century BCE when the Renaissance artists become very interested in classical history. Uh, they, uh, it gets to be, the monument gets to be represented in uh, the Christian narrative turning point, agony in the garden when Jesus is about to um, sacrifice himself. And within the Roman context, again, uh, antiquarian past, Caesar's triumph when the empire is about to come. So these kinds of moments, civilizational turning points, the other possibility, civilizational greatness. This is the kinds of context I found the image and also expectations of the end of the world. Because again, it's a multifaceted monument which appeals to different audiences. Uh, the expectation of the world for the Orthodox was 1492. Well, it's for the Americas, the end of the world in a way came in 1492, so it did come true in a way. But um, in terms of expectation of the end of the world, apocalyptic narratives. So either triumphal or tragic, Ottoman and then uh, Russian uh, context. Uh, this, this is the context in which these images appear. Um, looking widely is important in this case. And also, you know, coming, uh, I came to art history from physics. So you posit a theory, you posit an idea, and then you see whether or not this is reflected in the evidence. And the way looking at the images Images are manifestations of intellectual processes. So if we see an intellectual process in action, can we see whether or not it is expressing itself in the visual format? So I, guess I would say that's how I found uh, all sorts of images and it was fun looking for them. I think that's a great place to bring this to a close.
Um, again, uh, I strongly recommend the book that it's the Bronze Horseman of Justinian in Constantinople, the cross-cultural biography of a Mediterranean monument. And one of its great merits, as, as also with your previous book, is that you use the the way in which a monuments or a text in the, the case of your previous book travels from culture to culture and is seen in different ways. And it gives you this vantage point from which to discuss not just Byzantine culture, but you know, Slavic and Western medieval and Ottoman and you know, all you know, th these different cultures surrounding this monument for as long as it lasted is a thousand years. Uh, that's one of the great uh, virtues of being a Byzantinist. <laughs> so I like Absolutely. to see that you're, you're playing them up as much as possible. So uh, thank you again, Elena. And uh, I look forward to your next project. Thank you, Anthony. It was a pleasure as always. <laughs>